Coming up on Digital Music Trends 213 on the 17th of December 2014, a recap on a year of music tech news as we pick the ones that had the most impact, but also we explore this week's news with Mixcloud's latest stats, the BBC's first music industry conference, Shazam updated, Bose exploring music streaming, Beatport working on a streaming service and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to the last uh, Digital Music Trends episode of 2014. I'm Andrea Linali and this is a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and the uh, DMT is available on a, on a wide range of streaming services but if you are traveling over the holidays I would recommend that you go and download the show on a podcasting app of your choice. So if you have an iOS device it's actually built in now in iOS 8 it's called Podcast and on Android you can try out uh, Pocket Cast. Uh, I hear that Dog Catcher is no longer being updated so Pocket Cast now for Android go and check it out it be quite good and the show comes out pretty regularly every week but uh, as I said uh, once again it's the last show of the year so uh, the next time you're gonna hear from me is uh, the first week of uh, January and we're gonna continue uh, to cover uh, the best of what's happening in the digital music space uh, throughout 2015 and this week we're mixing it up uh, with a recap on what's been happening in uh, the past year and a few uh, new uh, fresh uh, items of news uh, uh, with uh, Darren Hemmings uh, the founder of digital marketing agency Motive Unknown so hi Darren and thanks for joining me how's it going? Hello, good to be here. Yeah, it's going good. It's going good. We're nearly there, right? We're nearly at Christmas. We're, nearly We're on at the Christmas. final leg, people. We're yeah. just a little bit more work and then we can all kick back and eat mince pies. Kind of, yes. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that's what I plan to do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the rest of you, I don't care. Do I, what you want. I, I'm trying. You know, I'm trying to be Christmassy. You, you, for the video viewers, uh, there's a lovely Christmassy village scene that I've picked out from one of my own photos because I didn't want to end up uh, in in issues with uh, taking uh, other people's photos. So one of my own photos from a Christmas trip I did a few years ago. Uh, a Christmas trip. Does that even make sense? Yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> And you can see lots of little people, but anyway, I would recommend people that are listening to the audio to go and check out at least a few seconds of the video to uh, take in this fantastically uh, Christmassy uh, uh, backdrop. <laughs> it's amazing. That I'm it's, uh, currently. My only regret is that you're too you're zoomed in too near. Yes. If, uh, if the uh, camera was only further let away, me, let me you could just give you an impression in. of how I would look if I was okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, for the audio listeners, this is terrible, but I just I just try to merge myself with the backdrop and and the little people in the in the uh, carnival. Anyway, uh, I, I think uh, I wanted to start this week. I, I actually took a, you know, a, f- a few minutes, well, more than a few minutes, uh, to uh, go back to the first show of the year and sort of write a bit of a recap of a month by month uh, uh, what's been going on uh, in the digital music industry uh, thing. Uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a f- maybe three or four minutes to read out, but I, I think it's going to be quite interesting. Uh, Darren, if you're up for it, I'm going to go for it. Yeah, no, I do. I mean, you right. know, as I said before, I think it's uh, it, it, may, it may benefit my <laughs> appalling memory. So uh, feel free. Right. And and um, maybe I will extract this for, for a separate segment. <laughs> this is <just> ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and so 2014 is coming to a close and this is the last show of the year. So here comes the inescapable recap. And we started in January discussing Grace Note's sale to Tribune and the launch of Grace Note to Rhythm, the launch of Beats Music in the United States, uh, Kim.com's the launch of Baboom, the growth of streaming in 2013, Spotify's integration with Topspin, SoundCloud's new round and Rap Genius's deal with UMPG. February brought us Medium and there I recorded some interviews with the likes of uh, Charles Carlos from Merlin, Luis Justo from Rock in Rio and Ken Hertz from Hertz, Liechtenstein and Young. February also saw a rise in the tensions between the music industry and YouTube, Beats Music AT&T partnership, Spotify's deal with The Times, Shuffler launching the Pause app, V-Contact's uh, Piracy Wars and the Warner's deal with Shazam. In March, Beats Music acquired Topspin, Ministry settled with Spotify in the playlist lawsuit. Uh, Australian music revenues dropped dramatically. We got the first rumors around uh, an Amazon music streaming service and then of course uh, a full two weeks of South by Southwest action with plenty of high-profile interviews with the likes of Pandora, Spotify, Openora and more. Plus the Econest was acquired by Spotify on the day I landed in Austin. Samsung launched Milk. Neil Young went full throttle on the Pono and Sonos announced Universal Search. I also headed down to the Miami Music Summit uh, which was a pretty awesome event and April was all about uh, YouTube Music delays, the launch of the Gramophone hardware project, Smule's uh, $16.6 million new round, Shazam's iOS 8 integration, Bloom FM's demise and another bunch of interviews recorded at the AIM Music Connected conference in London. And uh, May was uh, really all about Apple acquiring Beats Music and the independent revolt against YouTube. I headed down to the Great Escape, which was great fun as always. And June started with the official Apple announcement around Beats, uh, the review of the consent decrees in the US and then we had a very 
special show on the Brazilian music industry just before the World Cup kicked off. And finally, Amazon officially launched the Prime Music service and BitTorrent bundles reached 100 million downloads. In July, we got Ultra's lawsuit against Michelle Phan and a show focused on independent musicians covering Bandcamp, Patreon and Pledge at length. August saw Cizak acquiring Lumber Rumblefish, Merlin making a groundbreaking deal with Pandora, Spotify making a deal with Bandpage, Pono's a super successful crowdfunder campaign and SoundCloud unveiling its first step towards a new monetization strategy on SoundCloud. I also had it down to CEO Pop in Cologne which was a really interesting event. And September started off uh, with a great few days at Berlin Music Week where I recorded a show with a particular focus on the African uh, music market and also in September U2 annoyed hundreds of millions of people by releasing uh, Songs of Innocence on any uh, on all iTunes accounts in the world. And then we had two high quality streaming services launch which were Tidal and Deezer Elite and finally Clear Channel became iHeartMedia. In October I started off with a great show about music app design uh, while I was away which you can still check out. It's going to be good uh, even in a year's time I think. Uh, and then Tom York released uh, his new album on BitTorrent. Uh, SoundCloud hit some roadblocks with uh, major deals. Uh, Guy Oziri unveiled Maverick. Uh, AT&T dropped Beats and Pandora launched its AMP artist marketing platform. November was all about Taylor Swift's crusade against Spotify and the launch of YouTube Music Key Service uh, which uh, being in beta was somewhat disappointing. Also I had it down to the Web Summit in Dublin to record a few interviews and Apple was rumored to be integrating Beats into iOS in 2015. Finally we got a glimpse of Spotify's 2013 earnings filed in uh, uh, Europe which were really interesting. And finally we head into December as the UK industry bodies ask for a judicial review of copyright exceptions implemented in October and Apple was deemed not guilty in a decade-long antitrust lawsuit uh, surrounding the iPod. <laughs> that was an ambitious recap right? <coughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot went on, didn't it? Um, yeah. It's weird. When you put it like that, it seems like a, a hell of a lot happened. And yet, bizarrely, my sort of overarching view of this year was that nothing really big happened. Yeah. There's like a lot of stuff, but nothing like really, really kind of game changing and, and things like that. I mean, you know, a, a bit that there's been colossal growth in streaming and things like that. But just generally, it's, I don't know, you know, it feels a. There wasn't like a kind of, oh my God moment. Maybe yeah. I'm being selective with my memory. I don't know. But yeah, it was sort of everything that happened felt like it was just, you know, more developments on the path of the way things are going. You know, yeah. Apple announcing their buying beats was a big announcement, I guess, but it wasn't a surprise. Yeah. And so on, you know. So, and, it's and been so in that case, you would, uh, you would uh, disagree with Mark, with, uh, Mark Mulligan. He uh, said last, last week that uh, he thought 2014 was a sort of a. Uh, milestone year for the music industry in that sense yeah i mean uh, you know it's that's the thing really isn't it it's sort of i suppose but it's like everything we sort of crave big drama you know big developments yeah, yeah and all these things when when the fact that things have grown very nicely it sort of isn't in itself a massive news story but is nonetheless actually very significant so you know, I think Mark's probably got a point that maybe the biggest takeaway of this year is that actually, you know, the shift to streaming has been massive. Um, and, you know, a, a continuation down that path is is a good thing, really, because we're yeah. sort of, that's that's the future, that's where it's headed. And now I'm sort of thinking, well, the sooner we just sort of get there, the, the better, really, just for yeah. everyone. Because otherwise you have years of weirdness and uncertainty where we don't quite know which way to point our marketing efforts and things like that. Yeah, so, um, absolutely. Yeah, it's an interesting year. I wonder if we'll find this year more significant in hindsight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, we get to the end of 2015 and be like, well, 2014 was really the year when it kind of, you know, properly lifted up and, yeah. you know, momentum definitely gained pace. Yeah, and, and we'll go back to our top three uh, uh, stories of 2014 uh, at the end of the show. But first up, uh, well, let's uh, look at some of the news. And actually, I wanted to start out by uh, asking you or, or chatting a little bit about the BBC uh, on the Beat uh, conference that uh, mm. happened uh, last Friday. So, uh, I mean, f from my point of view, uh, you know, f I think the event... Uh, went really well. It was amazingly organized uh, for uh, for those that are based uh, not in the UK. The BBC held uh, uh, their own uh, sort of a fairly small uh, uh, music industry conference, but it was the first time they did so. So definitely a significant development for for uh, their priorities anyway. And 
this conference went really smoothly. It was really well organized, uh, some great people attending. Uh, from my perspective, I would have liked to see uh, more stats perhaps around the BBC's own music properties, since the presentations uh, by some of the companies were for me a little redundant. But at the same time, it was kind of hard because uh, uh, they had a lot of people from the BBC there. Uh, and so it was kind of hard to strike a balance between sharing internal data for the benefit of us, which were going there as, as external attendees, and then getting outside speakers to present on their company to inform the BBC's own staff uh, that was present so uh, I don't know if that sort of reflects uh, what, what you thought but uh, Will, Will Page's uh, presentation was uh, great as always uh, uh, on, on the Spotify front so what, what do you make of it? Um, I enjoyed it I thought it was a good start um, you know I, I kind of I think it's a good thing for them to do so yeah. I, I want them to do more uh, I just I, I felt at points like it just wasn't really going very deep into anything you know the opening presentation with Charlie Sloth and uh <clears throat> Shazam and and um, whoever the third person was, I forget. Um, <clears throat> but it, you know, it 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 was just sort of you know, YouTube is great. Shazam predicts hits, and it was all stuff that I feel like is uh, you know they're long established. You yeah. know, there wasn't really any news in that. I thought the bit and, and equally, you know, the the presence of uh, the chap from Ping Tunes on on the panel with Will Page and uh, George Ergotudis was. D just a bit of a mismatch, you know. Um, I, I've got nothing against ping tunes per se, but I, I definitely have a problem when you have um, industry events and people are basically standing there giving a sales pitch. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't need or want a sales pitch uh, for anything when I'm there, and what you're there to to get hopefully is more more kind of insights. And I think people like Will and Mark Mulligan and George Ergotudis all have, uh, you know, so much to offer on that front. And, and and they delivered on it, you know, they were all great. But equally, I think they highlighted the shortcomings elsewhere, uh, where perhaps more work could be done. I, I felt like perhaps the BBC maybe weren't sure who the attendees were. Yeah, I um, guess, yeah. There was, a, there was a sort of, I'm not, I'm not quite, because I think when you're, normally when you attend these things, you know that it is very much a music industry conference, and the, the attendees will be label people or people from around the music industry sort of ecosystem yeah. and therefore you can certainly present a series of panels that play to that and i just felt like maybe with this particular event they weren't entirely certain on who the attendees were um and consequently it was a slightly odd direction at a certain certain points as to you know who 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 they're talking to and yeah. how much interest some of those topics will be but yeah. as i said uh I, I welcome the BBC doing it, actually. I think the BBC could do it really, really well. And that's not to say that the one they did was bad, because it wasn't. It was very well organised, very well executed, as you said. Um, but I, I just feel that it, it needed to perhaps go a little bit deeper than it did. Yeah. Um, but, you know... Good start. Early, Definitely early days, a good start. So Absolutely. Good, good on them. Yeah. And as you said, it would be great if we were getting more from the BBC's own insights, because they sit on a treasure trove of, uh, of stuff there that they could impart for people like me, you know, and uh, more of that would be very welcome. Absolutely. And uh, uh, so the, the next news item was actually uh, Mixcloud reaching uh, 20 million, uh, 12 million active, uh, monthly active users uh, and uh, uh, sitting on, you know, a, a mountain of, of content on their end and, and really doing uh, quite well. Uh, they've uh, launched a, a sort of a, a mini site that showcases the last uh, five years of homepages on Mixcloud. They've reached, uh, you know, the a five year uh, uh, birthday essentially. And uh, I actually caught up with uh, Nico Perez, uh, co-founder of the company to uh, hear more about uh, what's been going on uh, there. So hi Nico and thanks for joining me. Some great announcements from Mixcloud this week. Uh, you guys have reached uh, 6 million uploads on the platform. So so uh, how does that feel? Yeah, no, it's it's a really great milestone for us. We're really proud of um, all the DJs, radio presenters and curators who have supported us and been involved in the platform over the years. Yeah, and the numbers are pretty impressive. Like, you know, uh, you, you guys reach, are reaching now 12 million monthly uh, users. Uh, and uh, the, the more, even more interesting is the fact that you have 650,000 different creators on the platform that are uploading content. So that's a pretty remarkable figure, given that it's, it's much higher in terms of percentage than the usual, I guess, creator to consumer ratio that you get on, on, on some platform. So, so how are you guys uh, sort of cultivating that uh, uh, creators community and, and uh, uh, I guess your focus now is still divided between you know growing the audience and growing the community, right? Yeah, it's it's always a tricky one of trying to sort of balance. It's essentially sort of like a marketplace, balancing the listeners with 
in our hand, we actually call them more curators rather than creators because essentially, you know, they are individuals who are experts in particular areas of music or audio. So right. whether they be DJs or radio presenters, you know, they're the people who are going out there, going digging through all the new releases and sort of pulling out what's best and presenting it to the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, finding that balance is definitely something that we talk about a lot. Um, I think we've done a fairly good job right now. And you have to sort of flip flop and focus between each group. Yeah, exactly. And then have you found the last few months in the States? So what, what's the reception like? Yeah, it's been really good. Uh, so I moved to New York City and I've been working on sort of raising our profile there. Um, we definitely have a lot of work to do. Like, you know, we we definitely come from uh, London where we were sort of a relatively large fish in a small pond. And, you know, in America, we're a small fish in a big pond. Right. Um, so I have a lot of work to do in that in that respect. But I think a lot of people are starting to recognize the sort of value that we bring in the place that, w that we sit sort of within the wider ecosystem of yeah. Uh, internet music and radio. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, uh, towards that, Anna, actually, you uh, also announced uh, uh, that uh, Fred McIntyre has joined your board of advisors, which must be a good thing because he has experience on both sides of the Atlantic uh, with the Last FM as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we we recently announced two uh, people joining our advisory board. So Fred McIntyre, who has a lot of history with obviously Last FM before yeah. that AOL, um, Stitcher Radio, or AOL back in the day. Sorry. Um, and then on the other side, uh, Richard Cohen, who uh, comes from a business called Love Live, yeah. which is based in, in London as well. And a lot of experience there around live music and recording live events and things like that. So we're really excited to have them. I think they bring a little bit of a little bit more gray hair uh, to, to, uh, <laughs> to uh, our, our team. I only have a few right now, but. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and so you know it's uh, five years on Mixcloud. I think you know one of the things that I talk about always when I talk about Mixcloud is sort of your very unique uh, uh, take on uh, building a startup, which has been sort of uh, very different from uh, how a lot of uh, other startups uh, have done it, uh, as far as you know, uh, going it uh, bootstrapped and sort of growing the team as you as you grew the audience and, and the revenues. And so, uh, in that sense, uh, do you feel like uh, you are in, in a better place than some other companies now because you? have ownership of the company you can decide what, what your direction is going to be and you can uh, sort of rely on, on a fairly steady base of income that you actually already have yeah i mean we we're certainly in this sort of uh one of the rare positions of uh having grown the company entirely ourselves and bootstrapped it and so that does afford us quite a lot of freedom in terms of you know which direction we want to go in what we want to focus on uh, what problems we want to solve Yeah. Um, you know, it also comes with constraints. So, you know, we can't always uh, grow the team as fast as we like. We can't yeah. hire, you know, really, really expensive, um, yeah. top-notch senior people. So it's it's a balance, you know, and I think so far to date, we've kind of managed to uh, to get that balance right. And it, it, it's really important for us that at the end of the day, we keep going for this vision of sort of redefining radio yeah. and making it relevant for the dig digital generation. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and obviously, if anybody in the audience hasn't checked out the site, uh, go on Mixcloud.com and also you can find a bit of a summary of uh, how the homepage looked like uh, uh, five years ago and sort of a progression through the years on blog.mixcloud.com. And there's a link to five years of Mixcloud there, which is a, a pretty nice uh, look back at how uh, you guys looked like uh, back in uh, 2009. And uh, uh, <laughs> I think I think we met actually just before you launched, right? Uh, Yeah, we go back. Yeah, quite, we go back we quite a long way. We've, <laughs> we've been in touch for for a few years yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know the the homepage evolution was just a cool way to kind of kind of showcase you know how far we've come and how the design has changed and yeah. how some things have actually stayed consistent. So. Exactly, and it's it's you know it's good to have a you know the first homepage was pretty nice as well. So uh, I wouldn't want to to uh, get anybody to go back and listen to my first podcast because it was terrible. So <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely not something I would recommend doing. Uh, and uh, uh, Nico, so uh, it's the end of the year. Obviously, I'm, uh, I've written this ridiculous uh, 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 sort of year roundup uh, that's going to take me about four minutes to say, and I might faint uh, halfway through. But uh, uh, as far as you're concerned, you know wh what did you feel was the the news that you perceived? to be the biggest or the most uh, uh, interesting or most influential for 2014 as far as digital music was concerned? Uh, it's, it, it's a tough one. Uh, you put, it's kind of put me on the spot. I mean, I think the, the first thing that sort of comes to mind, and maybe this is because I was reading this the other day, is uh, 
uh, a sort of proposal article put forward by a, a guy called D.A. Wallace, who's an artist in residence at Spotify. And he was talking about the idea of leveraging the technology behind Bitcoin and the distributed ledger as being potentially a solution to um, the organization of metadata around who owns rights to what uh, going forward in the future. And uh, that's, a, that's a world that we're kind of heavily involved in. You know, we're, we're licensed, we pay royalties, but there's all, all these questions around actually, um, you know, which artist, which label, yeah. um, rights to which song. And there's actually no definitive worldwide global database of, the, of these things. Oh, wow, uh, that's and, uh, uh, awesome. It's a really interesting area. I think there's, you know, it, it, it maybe hasn't been so much in the news this year, but I think going forward, that's going to be an exciting area to explore. Absolutely, and uh, you know I, that's great that you said that actually because uh, I think it definitely falls outside what we might talk about to join the rest of the show, and uh, yeah, I'm definitely excited to see what uh, uh, companies are going to come up with. You know, we we, we saw the uh, global repertoire database uh, fall apart, uh, uh, the project fall apart in 2014, and so obviously there's going to be some commercial players that are going to look at uh, how that can be replicated somehow uh, uh, in in a more commercial environment. Uh, we have uh, uh, guys like Music Brains that are doing some fantastic work uh, on the metadata side and we have uh, some other sort of more out there proposals like the Bitcoin one which uh, it could be very very interesting so uh, thanks a lot for that that's that's uh, really fun and, and thanks so much for joining me today Nico uh, once again mixcloud.com go and check out uh, the latest uh, updates and uh, and uh, go and check out the service if you haven't before and we're back and, and so Darren uh, what do you make of uh, you know this this growth of mixcloud and uh, uh, you know we've been talking about the fact that uh, people have been migrating from other services uh, uh, because mixcloud, mixcloud is licensed and so uh, they don't have the fear of their uh, mix is being taken down uh, you know do you think that there's more room for growth for a service like that I really do I mean I, I, Mixcloud I, I love Mixcloud and I think the team there are, are, are really good people you know they're, they're, they've, all, they've always been a, a great bunch I mean, as much on a personal level, frankly. So, you know, they could be running a dreadful company, but they're, they're good lads. <laughs> yeah. um, but but uh, I, I sort of feel like Mixcloud is, is like two steps away from really, really like finding this amazing space. Yeah. Because I think there's a massively untapped area of, I mean, you know, obviously because of their name, mixes. Uh, but just generally, you know, mixes, radio shows, all those kinds of things, which are definitely coming into increased trouble with SoundCloud, with audio lock, you know, picking up, uh, you know, detecting things within mixes and all sorts of stuff, taking them down. Um, and there's definitely been, a, 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 you know, a lot of DJs I've seen kind of walking off of SoundCloud because their mixes are being pulled for copyright and things like that. Yeah. And it feels like Mixcloud have got that space very nicely buttoned down. But it, maybe what they need more is just the, you know, a better way to integrate elsewhere and really proliferate it out yeah i mean you know 12 million users is a huge number let's you know let's not do them a disservice there it's a massive number uh, a lot more than i thought i have to be frank um but i think if they could really you know i mean a, an obvious example would be getting on something like sonos yeah you know where they would then instantly tap into that market um and i i sort of find myself wishing that they would be on that because i was a a huge consumer of, you know, hip-hop mixtapes in particular through the kind of 90s, I guess, you know, mid to late 90s. And it, and it really was a, an art form unto itself, yeah. which has now been put to the sword, as have many hip-hop albums, you know, De La Soul's back catalogue being the perfect case in point, because of sample clearance issues. So um, whilst Mixcloud can't fix all of that, I think in the, in the realm of mixes in particular, they could really find this beautiful space to, to fill. Yeah. And so whilst 12 million is a phenomenal number for which I'd absolutely congratulate them, um, I sort of think like actually they could, they could do 10 times that, you know, and, and still be growing well. They, yeah. you know, they, they've got a real opportunity to, to, to go huge. Um, but as I said, it's, it's less than model, you know, with everyone else we yeah, tend to sure, talk about sure. things saying, well, if they could just fix the monetizing or if they could just do this or that. I think with Mixcloud, it's sort of more that they just need to get more places to be accessible from, you know, and if they could just bolt into those platforms like Sonos and, and all these sorts of things, then um, maybe they would, uh, f you know, just see a, a greater uptick in in usage, I don't yeah, it's know. Gonna, it's going to be interesting, actually, because uh, I <clears> guess <throat> like they are operating under sort of like a, a Pandora-esque license. Uh, so 
it'd be interesting to see how they manage to deliver an experience on a, on a third party app because of course a lot of the adver- like all the advertise all the most of the uh, money they make is from uh, uh, advertising still I mean they have a, a good uptake of subscriptions they do have a subscription service now uh, so mm. it would be interesting to see how, how they manage to sort of integrate the ad- adverts into a third party experience where they don't control the visuals and stuff uh, but, yeah uh, uh, <coughs> But exciting to hear uh, them doing so well and definitely looking forward to more next year. And actually a story that ties in very well with this is to look at another company that is uh, working in a similar space, at least uh, specialized in dance music, which is Beatport. And Beatport, uh, uh, it was reported uh, yesterday by the Wall Street Journal that they uh, are essentially switching the Beatport.com store into a Beatport Pro store, and uh, so that's where the actual uh, sale of MP3 is going to happen, and it's going to be catered uh, again at uh, DJs and and sort of more professional music uh, consumers that are using the mixes for uh, their own sets. Uh, whilst the Beatport.com is going to be transitioned into an ad-supported uh, streaming service. Uh, uh, I mean, I found this a very fascinating news. Uh, it's kind of weird to think that they would go the ad-free uh, route rather than creating a premium service, given how difficult it is to monetize through advertising, uh, and also. You know, I, I'm looking at companies uh, like, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of that company. What was it? Um, uh, there are a couple of companies that essentially tried to, uh, uh, Post Locker, that's the one. Post Locker uh, was, uh, uh, has been uh, sort of looking at the streaming uh, space for uh, dance music for uh, some time. I think they're still live, but they've, they've been through some shuffles. So I'm not sure what's happening with them at the moment. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think if that kind of model was, deployed by Beatport it'd be really interesting because of course Beatport already has a huge audience whilst Pulse Locker has to start from from zero essentially uh, and uh, but yeah I kind of puzzled by the fact that it's, it's being reported as being an ad, ad uh, supported service uh, but apart from that it it's kind of seems like it makes sense uh, they couldn't <coughs> keep selling mp3s forever right mm. no that's right I mean the, you know I suspect they would have just been forecasting a general downturn on the MP3 sales and realizing it's more of a niche market now um, to serve those pro DJs and things like that. So I don't know. I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, equally with regard to the ad supported route, if they are offering it as an ad supported service, then I would imagine it's to preempt a premium service ultimately, you know, that will be a pay to remove the ads because that's the model that's been proven to work for, uh, for Spotify. So with that in mind, Seems logical to me, I have to say. I mean, I'm sort of curious as to the degree to which people will start wanting uh, slightly more niche services, you know, to deliver on what, they, what they're what they into. Because yeah. it is that tyranny of choice problem, and I still find it with Spotify, where I just don't really know where to go when you dive in there. And it's like when you used to walk into HMV in Oxford Street, and there'd be, you know, a billion CDs in front of you, and you're just sat there being like, oh, yeah. Christ, where do I begin, you know? Um so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I, I can see all the logic there. I, I, I think the question is just basically whether it will uh, present a decent alternative to someone like Spotify when yeah. they've had so much of a march on this kind of stuff, because it's probably not really within any artist's, uh, you know, interests to only have content on the Beatport streaming service, yeah. for example. I mean, they have a lot so, of muscle because they have all the fa- they, they've got all these festivals. That's a fact. The, the <coughs> owner of Beatport uh, now uh, controls all these festivals, so they could push it tremendously in in those spaces and and cultivate an audience through that. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it would be interesting to see. Certainly, I mean, I think there'll be a few of these. You know, and we've seen it. You know, niche services popping up, but maybe for different reasons. I yeah. mean, even that tidal with the the high quality stream and things like that i mean they're all trying it i'm just not sure that they will necessarily get there yet yeah maybe in due course but i think you know it's that thing a bit like when napster first launched a kind of streaming service all those years ago the market just wasn't really ready for it because we weren't you were we weren't there yet conceptually no one had switched to that kind of notion that you didn't own music and yeah. you just rented it and you know streamed it or whatever um and uh yeah i just wonder if maybe this is the same with these where five years down the line when we're all much more in the streaming world a more niche proposition that has better editorial and maybe more exclusive content and stuff i think that could fly but yeah. right now when we're still trying to sell everyone on streaming it's more difficult. not so sure yeah i mean the, the other thing i was wondering is that post locker when i talked to them a, a few times uh, they kept stressing the fact that a lot of the dance music labels uh, do not give their content to spotify at least they didn't uh, probably like a uh, 18 months ago when I spoke to them so I would love actually to hear from people that are really into dance music that are listening to the show uh, to tell me a little bit more about what 
uh, Spotify's catalog is, how, like what the situation is around uh, dance music catalog on Spotify. Obviously, the labels are uh, that are doing very specific uh, music that is perhaps you know the value is in, in it being purchased uh, either as a vinyl or as an mp3 they they still may not want to have the music on there uh, at, at the rates that they're getting so uh, definitely interesting to see if there's a space for beatport to license catalogs that are not available uh, on other streaming services yeah i mean it's a funny one i mean i've <laughs> being something of a long-standing metal fan as well i've often found that spotify fell a bit short on that front beyond your sort of obvious uh, major label targets but when you started digging onto the indie side you know there's some really notable exceptions i mean southern lord is still not on there i don't believe right. on spotify and that's you know they're a pretty influential metal label um but i have to say you know that was you know certainly i felt a year ago that there really weren't many of these labels on there and it was quite interesting because now obviously we're at the end of the year and everyone's doing their best of 2014 type thing and all of that and um I was really surprised, you know, looking through both the Quietus's top 10 metal albums of the year and Rolling Stone's top 10. I think at least eight of them were on Spotify and they were all, you know, like Omadon and, you know, Yob and all these kind of like really, you know, not Metallica. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like pretty edgy, pretty kind of niche stuff, but they were all on there. So I kind of think, you know, and I think it is this thing where it's just like, well, don't be silly. You know, the, there is money to be made there. And there's a yeah. point where holding off is just affecting your bottom line and not in a good way. So I suspect if if there were people holding off, there is significantly less now. Yeah. And, and talking about streaming uh, streaming services and, and, and niches, uh, uh, Bose uh, is was being rumored yesterday to uh, be working on the launch of a new streaming service. I mean, those were the headlines. Essentially, what happened is that uh, uh, Hypot, I believe, uh, stumbled onto a, a, a job uh, a advert on uh, Bose's site uh, where they were hiring for a senior user experience designer to lead design and prototyping of our next generation streaming music platform and ecosystem of products. So this was a job posting. You know, you could interpret the head, the, 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 what was written in that post in different ways. One of the interpretations is that they are actually active working on, on creating a, a new streaming service that they would launch as part of the Bose ecosystem, uh, mm. which uh, sounds crazy to me, but that's what some of the headlines went with. Uh, the other interpretation that I had was the fact that they might be working on a great user experience uh, around a new streaming ecosystem that aggregates uh, other services like Sonos is doing, which would make a hell of a lot more sense uh, than them spending a all that money to create an, uh, yet another streaming service uh, because mm. of course it, it feels like they've been sort of uh, you know uh, Sonos is, is kind of much more advanced than Bose in that they have this app ecosystem they have imported all these services uh, rolled them into their speakers and you can access them directly and it's, it's so much easier essentially to, the whole experience is just quite seamless so I, I, it would make sense for Bose to go in that direction but to create another Spotify I don't know Darren what do you think? Um, I agree with you. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> to be honest, it's yeah. It it. it uh, I think history's taught us that those kind of. Um, I mean, you know, I'm I'm old enough to remember when Sony first started their music download services that only sold in the AdTrack three format and sort of only worked on Sony yeah. devices. You know, the whole thing was a play to lock in sony walkman users and everything onto you know onto their world and it just it did not work because and and it you know and it, it there was a sort of weird arrogance to it you know where you think well yeah. i don't i don't want to be bound to just having everything on that system so that i have to now buy all your hardware if i want to keep listening to it so i completely agree with you you know i think uh, it would make you know pretty good sense for them to create a portal like environment like sonos and just pull in these other services um, but would make little to no sense moving into a market that is already pretty horribly congested, yeah. uh, you know, and with and with no real standout feature for them, you yeah. know, so any more than it would have made sense for Sonos to run their own streaming service. Yeah, exactly. So if you are working at Bose and you are thinking of doing the streaming service, then stop <laughs> yeah, and have no. a think. <laughs> Our yeah, vote is a very stop. strong no. Stop. <laughs> think again. <laughs> and listen. We have spoken. Uh, yeah. I'm sure they listen to us. We're terribly influenced. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get it all the time. And 
<laughs> I totally changed my mind, you know. Uh, yeah. And, uh, um, you know, we talked about Shazam briefly in the BBC, uh, uh, you know, what we covered the BBC conference, and, and Shazam actually have unveiled uh, uh, an overhaul of the app, uh, which now includes a bunch of content. So interesting here because Shazam had been pushing for the last uh, sort of 12 months, uh, they've really been pushing hard on the advertising and TV links, and so it's nice to see them sort of... Uh, focus back on on the music front and uh, rehaul the app they've uh, integrated a, a trending chart uh, w with the data on the number of shazams which is something that uh, beforehand was a, a you know a, a, a private number that was only disclosed to radio stations and, and music industry players and you also get playlists of top tracks as well as uh, additional materials and exclusive videos that they're actually shooting of of trending bands they're getting them in a studio and shooting some videos with them which is very pretty cool so they can prove essentially that they can predict who's going to get big and who's not uh, uh, and so, you know, uh, skipping uh, all the rest of the presentation that they did at the BBC, uh, uh, how do you feel about the, re the, the overhaul? Do you think that uh, Shazam was overdue doing something like this that made the app more of a destination rather than just a, a place where you Shazam? And uh, uh, will the whole thing help with their efforts in, in the second screen department as well? Um, it seems logical to me. Um, I mean, I, I worry slightly about another destination with yeah. these places and more editorial there's a sort of because sometimes you know you you have artists just being pressured from all corners to to start doing sessions and you know, i think it was a there was a somebody i forget who commenting a few months ago that you know you as an artist now you know you could do sessions you know five days a week <laughs> sort of throughout your entire tour and and flood the market with numerous you know reasonably well shot but slightly ropey live versions of of a of an album track you know so um there's, there's a degree of fatigue one might say around that but it does make a lot of sense i i i still just i found myself during their presentation at the bbc thing just being still quietly irritated by the fact that they refuse to open up their data to other people yeah so within you know platforms like next big sound um where you know certainly i spend a lot of time tracking what's going on and just looking to see where things are responding um it's incredibly annoying that shazam data is not within that because you know they're absolutely right that their data is extremely valuable um but it's sort of locked in in a manner that we can't readily access it and i find it, it all the more perplexing only because if i could see that i was getting a ton of shazam tags around an artist then i would absolutely consider spending money advertising or retargeting those people on shazam because that's what you you know you can do that so yeah. if loads of people tag uh, my artist then i can book ads with shazam that retarget those people with to upsell an album so it was there was there was a sort of strange thing of thinking well the the editorial is lovely but i can't help but think that we would do you know, actual business from, from, yeah, from the from the industry side, which I suppose the, that's the sad reality is I'm forever looking at it with that hat on. Yeah, I was sort of just looking at it, thinking I, I just wish you would open up your data. I mean, the irony is I can get the data by badgering the people at Shazam, but I'm pretty sure they don't thank me for that either. So <laughs> you know, opening yeah. up an API for for Next Big Sound would would be fantastic, and it doesn't even have to be you know 100% live. Just as with Spotify, where you've got about a two day delay, where they you know accrue the numbers um it would just be good to have the same sort of thing on shazam and i think yeah. that would inform stuff so much more and ironically would i think probably assist their whole case for more people using them yeah you know yeah. if i know that shazam is now becoming a massive point of contact uh, with my artist then absolutely i'd advocate having them then go and do a session for shazam and all kinds of other things but um on the whole i think it's a good move I just hope that the app sort of stay it doesn't doesn't become you know wildly cluttered and you know there's, there's always a chance with these things that they'll just become a bit of a mess yeah as everyone tries to spew in features and you know um i think spotify sort of fell foul of that yeah uh you know which they're now correcting but uh, so i hope shazam control that a little bit but so far so good Yes, absolutely. And uh, uh, actually, I don't know uh, if anybody uses the uh, Siri thing uh, uh, on Shazam. Uh, I actually haven't even tried it yet. Uh, so yeah, that's that's one thing that was, you know, we, we made a big deal out of it when it, when it happened that they integrated into iOS 8. Uh, mm. Which obviously made sense, but because the feature is buried in Siri and that's limited to Siri, uh, I just wonder 
uh, if many people are using it, essentially the you have to suggest a phrase like Siri Shazam the song or what's the song or name that tune. These are some of the phrases you can use on iOS 8 to tag it on Shazam. At the same time, it kind of, uh, you know, Siri is, is already ropey as it is. Uh, I wonder if it would be able to detect the voice quite well with the, a song playing in the background as well. Uh, there's some issues around that too, probably. Um, yeah, I mean, funny enough, I, I tried it for the first time on my Android phone the other day because right. obviously you can do it in Google now as well. We can say, you know, okay, Google, what song is this or whatever, and it will listen and tell you. Um, except typically for Google, you know, they're not using Shazam. They've just reverse engineered the same technology and, and launched their own one. Um, yeah. But it, no, actually, it worked surprisingly well. Oh, cool. um, so, nice. yeah, it was, it was quite useful. But uh, I think all of those things get fairly minimal use, if we're brutally honest. You know, if I had a shortcut on my Android phone that just was, you know, press here to Shazam then I'd use that because you wouldn't yeah. get out your phone and start yelling at it to do stuff any more than you would with Siri. But uh, So I think it's of limited appeal, really. Yeah. Nice idea, but just in execution, people can't be bothered. They'll do it with their hands, not their mouth. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and let's move on to the Sony hack. And I was just waiting for this to happen. I mean, uh, we, <laughs> we've heard all about this Sony uh, uh, Pictures uh, hack and all mm. that came with that. And uh, uh, last night, uh, uh, this morning, actually, uh, TechCrunch posted a story uh, that is uh, revolving around uh, Sony Music, uh, actually, and some emails that went in between Sony Entertainment uh, CEO Michael Linton uh, uh, with uh, uh, Snapchat CEO uh, Evan Spiegel, and uh, essentially they were chatting about how they could, uh, how um, Snapchat was interested in uh, uh, creating a sort of music uh, feature within the app, uh, and they uh, the bit of a back and forth on emails. Uh, you know, they had a chat with Vivo's CEO, and uh, uh, which fell apart due to uh, uh, revenue share uh, uh, issues. Issues, you know, uh, Snapchat wanted 40% of the ad revenue on, on the uh, videos that were served, and Vivo uh, didn't want to go for that. Uh, and then we had uh, more emails with uh, Epic CEO Ali Reid, and uh, uh, essentially, you know, an interesting sort of evolution of, of the idea f from Snapchat's perspective of wanting to do a, a music feature and how they were working with Sony to make that happen. I, I mean, it's, it kind of feels it's weird because on, on the one side, it feels wrong to be talking about this because I still feel like this is data that has been stolen. But at the same time, mm. everybody's talking about it. So it's kind of like, doesn't really make any sense for me to go, oh no, I'm not going to talk about it because this is data that was stolen from Sony. And so I, I don't feel like it, it's really fair that it should all be discussed. So I don't know. Or what are your yeah. feelings about, about, about all this? Yeah, it's a weird one, isn't it? I saw someone else make exactly the same remark where it's kind of like we were all up in arms when we had the naked celebs iCloud hack and everyone's like, you know, this is an outrage and we shouldn't be distributing this stuff and people should be arrested for even looking at it yeah. uh, and all that sort of thing. And yet with the Sony stuff, it's funny how when the content is uh, significantly more um, postable because it's safe for work you know it's not naked stuff um, then uh you know they seem to be infinitely more lax about their moral judgment as they're in the go yeah we'll, we'll post it up so yeah. i kind of share your view really i'm a bit uncomfortable with uh talking about it it's been quite funny because depending on what podcasts you listen to and things like that it's sort of you know the overarching takeaway from the Sony uh, Pictures hack was just that all the people that work at Sony Pictures aren't very nice. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of it's sort of exposed them to be like a bunch of bunch of high schoolers, you know, and the way they talked and everything was just a bit kind of like, yeah. huh? They're not they're not you know they really do just kind of carry themselves in the same way as everyone else, but they're just uh, a bit more evil. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it, you know beyond that. Nah, I mean, you know, let's be honest, Snapchat launching a music thing. I mean, messaging and music services are on an absolute collision course anyway. Yeah. We've got Line trying to launch their music streaming service. It wouldn't be good it... for Ping Tune. You are sorry? It wouldn't be good for Ping Tune. <laughs> but apart from that. <laughs> <laughs> I just Ping Tune just left such a sour taste in my mouth by doing such a, a an unbelievably sales bright thing, yeah. sales pitch. And it was that right. thing that was like, I've stopped caring how good your product is. I just I'm I'm offended by the way in which you're subverting a BBC <laughs> event to discuss things into just one big pitch for your service. It's uh, anyway. I mean, yeah. I, I kind of thought this story was interesting just because it didn't have any negative side to it that I could see. 
so I mean in in that in that sense it just seemed to be a, an interesting insight into the process uh, of a discussion or the evolution of a discussion between uh, different players in the industry uh, and it doesn't really unveil anything shocking I mean one can quite easily understand that if Vivo almost made a deal with them and didn't it was probably due to revenue and uh, revenue share you know it's not something that uh, is is totally uh, awful or something you know uh, that uh, would would land sony in really bad waters but yeah i thought it was an interesting story to talk about but uh, mm. uh, I, I, you know it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next few months uh, with the leaks and because it could be really damaging to sony music if all the emails of conversations i've had with all the different streaming services came out that would be like wow <laughs> I, I, I mean i i can i can only just sit back and marvel at the i mean a hack of that scale is they, I mean, they reckon it's something like hundreds of terabytes of data has been stolen. Right. Now, it takes me days just to copy, like, you know, 100 gigabyte of stuff on my local Wi-Fi. How the hell do you offload that volume of data? I mean, I can only assume that the hack, you know, logistically was, was local, was somebody in the building just literally copying the stuff off because the the breadth and depth of the hack is such that it's t you know it, it couldn't be any worse if they literally pulled up with a flatbed truck and just loaded every server in the place onto it and drove off so it's i just i'm i'm stunned by you know the 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 just sheer sort of completeness of this hack i mean it is total yeah. it's not like they grabbed a bit of data they've literally duplicated the entire server structure for that entity which is i mean on the one side it's i'm terrifying. sort of in awe yeah. of the no, of the way that someone has managed to execute that but on the other it's i mean it's a it's i mean sony are just becoming a sort of running joke i mean you know bearing in mind we had all the you know the playstation hacks and all these kinds of things before now yeah. for this to happen to them is is does not say a lot about and at this it. time as well because you know, sony pictures was actually one of the few uh, i believe it was pretty like one of the few divisions that was profitable uh uh or at least was making good money because uh, the rest of mm. sony have, has had severe issues because the japanese economy has gone uh downhill and uh you know there were issues with the uh, currency exchanges and all sorts of stuff that sort of created a massive you know the earthquake hit and uh you know all sorts of mm. things that happened to sony there's you know uh, lg and samsung took a massive chunk of their tv sales and all sorts of other things uh, uh devices so it's not a good time for sony and definitely something they could have done without uh in 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 terms of you know 2014 but uh, most definitely yes it's a shame a shame to hear that uh, and a uh, very last second news actually that topspin is no longer a spotify a uh, merch seller it just came out uh, uh, a, a few minutes ago and uh, apparently uh, that leaves uh, Bandpage as the only reseller of uh, 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 merchandise on spotify i hope that we're going to see more uh, retailers uh, get on board and and do uh, uh, things directly on the platform i'm i'm hoping mm. uh some somebody like pledge or some something like that will will come along and actually manage to integrate some of the campaigns uh around uh with spotify that could be quite interesting uh but yeah. I, I don't know i mean i, I just I, I think it's uh i've got to doff my cap to the guys at Bandpage for just pulling off a masterful pivot yeah <laughs> with this do you think that their original business was kind of custom facebook tabs and you know they've they've dug in there and when they relaunched with this i was kind of like well that's a, not a bad idea um but you know they've really persevered and as i said you've got to take your hat off to, to jay and the team there because yeah they're, they're, you know they've they're, i mean i think they've done a great job of be, being the last man standing in a very good way you know so when all these other companies uh you know come and go or are sort of acquired and therefore eliminated from their presence elsewhere as was the case with topspin you know it's um it's all to their benefit but good on them you know yeah. uh, and their services it's a very smart and logical one yeah. to connect the dots across all these services you know in the same way that i love the fact that songkick is you know makes managing artists gig data so unbelievably easy yeah. just because Frankly, I've never had to put in a date on a song kick for a song kick artist, but I can sit there knowing full well that having plugged in all of their profiles, that data will then appear on a multitude of different platforms. And it's that approach really with Bandpage. I think it's, it's, it's smart. You know, all power to them. I think it's, uh, it's a great move.
And uh, that actually links in pretty well with uh, talking about uh, the uh, top stories of the year. And uh, uh, I'm thinking, should we go three, two, one, one, two, three? I mean, to be honest, the one to three doesn't really make much sense. It depends really on on what kind of factors you're taking into account in, in making the ranking. But uh, uh, you know, one of the stories that I uh, thought was probably like as you mentioned before the biggest story of the year for me uh, is uh, the apple and beats sort of uh, saga essentially you know it's, it's been a story that we've been talking ab about since january uh, and you know beats starting as a standalone company and then uh, sort of starting off with a bit of a shaky start but then making this big deal with the at and uh, and then the first rumors appearing around the acquisition the acquisition itself uh, and everything that came with that and, and now uh, potentially a, a, an integration into ios uh, which could be huge for uh, streaming because if uh, again as i said uh, before on the show if if, if you, in your your music uh, uh, app that you usually use for uh, your ipod music you got a free trial of a month of a streaming service you have all the music in the world that could really drive home the idea of streaming to a lot of people that haven't tried it before uh, if, uh, for you Darren well, what, what's the number one news uh, uh, of, of the year um, I mean I think that's probably the most significant one I, I think you know as, as we commented before we started recording you know I think that probably the most significant story even though it isn't a story in and of itself is just the monstrous growth of streaming services yeah. in general um you know and, and as i said i don't it, it's not that any one particular company has necessarily stepped out and said you know we've you know we've done this that and the other you know they've all reported their returns but overall if you look at the growth of streaming through 2014 it's been pretty dramatic yeah. and it was interesting attending the spotify managers event uh recently where they sort of showed their payouts because you know, it's like the payouts for the last 12 months or something have kind of exceeded pretty much all the other years previously combined or something, you know, yeah. to, it's like a billion dollars where the year before that, you know, the same period previously was uh, uh, less than 500 million. So, you know, things like that, where you look at it and, you know, and it was sort of prior to that would have been 200 or something. So, you know, uh, you could tot up all of their payouts from kind of 2008 or whenever they launched to 2013 or 2012. Yeah. Um, and it wouldn't match, you know, the last 12 months. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it, I think that's the, the most significant story, even though it's not really the I most thought, yeah. sort of dramatic or salacious or any of that business. You know, we had the YouTube versus the indies and, and all these other spats, the Taylor Swift stuff and everything else. But um, I think, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's not a sexy story in and of itself that streaming's grown extremely well, but it's uh, it is nonetheless the most notable one for me. Yeah, um, and I mean, like, and a, it, in a sense, the Taylor Swift story is uh, an extension of that thread in the sense that essentially just drove home the fact that she said this, and then everybody in the world reported it, which shows goes to show that people care about streaming. Yeah, I mean, I think they probably care more about Taylor Swift. Yeah. Um, which led the led that coverage, and it's a continual annoyance to me that you know the coverage of these things is is always informed by the level of stardom of the person involved. Um, you know, which means when a, a lesser artist comes out with an infinitely more positive story, it perhaps doesn't get quite so much pickup. Yeah. I mean, even you know when Ed Sheeran commented at the BBC Music Awards that he owed his career to Spotify and that he was a huge fan and, and all of these things. It got some coverage, but in nowhere near the same quantity as the Taylor Swift story, which, <laughs> on that respect, I, I slightly sympathise with the guys at Spotify because you're just sitting there thinking, the minute anyone says something bad, it gets like 10 times as much coverage as the rare times you get people... Because, you know, people... People don't step forward to issue public statements about the, the fact that they like something. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't work like that. Whereas when you're hating on things, they do. And so, it, you know, I do sympathize with them. It's, uh, it must be incredibly annoying, <laughs> you know. Not that they would ever admit to that, I'm sure. But, yeah. uh, it, you know, I, uh, yeah, I just would think it must grind you down a little. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, yeah. uh, it, I think the Taylor Swift story was interesting for the debate in general. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what it's really done beyond that. Um, I mean, maybe it's for Spotify to defend themselves a bit more, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. 
because sometimes I think Spotify have sort of taken a, a stance of silence that maybe has worked against them. Yeah. You know, um, it forced them to you know. to actually sort of make a make a debate out of it and actually yeah come make out a there point. You know, I mean, it was, in, yeah. it was interesting at the Spotify managers event because they you know they went to great pains to sort of outline just how the free service is limited and how it is not as simple as oh I'll just listen to Taylor Swift's new album with some adverts tossed in. Yeah, you know, in and, and and so they you know they I think they actually acquitted themselves very well at the managers event and. Um, I remember saying as much in the digest and, and and Spotify emailing me to say thank you for, for the for the kind words, which was quite funny because I sort of replied going, well, <laughs> I'm only saying what I think. And to be honest, if I thought you were being assholes, then I'd yeah. say that as well. Yeah, so, exactly. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you get it both ways, guys. This is not me trying to unveil myself to Spotify for, for, uh, for favours. It was just a, a genuine yeah. viewpoint. And equally, I'll... I'll be first in line to give you a kicking if uh, Something if wrong. I disagree with what you're yeah. doing. But no, I just think we've reached a point where uh, part of me just thinks, oh, for the love of God, can we cut them some slack? You know, they 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 do listen. They're trying hard. I feel as someone working in music marketing and working with bands that Spotify's artist team are very uh, reachable, personable, always go out of the way to help. They are a great bunch. And, um, you know, it's no it's not perfect nothing ever is but they are you know they're really doing everything they can and at this point they're doing a lot more than most on that front because god knows i've had meetings with other music services where yeah. there's been nowhere near as you know good on any level people just haven't offered uh, you know the same positive response or anything so yeah, yeah it's uh you know I, I really hope we start to see the tide turn a bit now absolutely and it'd be, it'd be good too. and uh, for me the, the one story that i have to sort of eat my hat on uh, is the uh, pono because uh, i guess when pono was announced uh, uh back in at the end of 2013 i believe uh, uh i i was extremely extremely skeptical about the whole thing uh, uh i didn't think it would work i didn't think the player made sense uh, i didn't think anything made sense to be honest uh, uh, but as uh, even as one can continue to question uh, the Pono as a hardware device itself, even though they have raised $12 million to make it happen between the crowdfunder campaign and Kickstarter. Uh, I, I can't deny that it has created a tide of uh, uh, interest in ha higher definition music, which is certainly not a bad thing from my point of view. And even though the services that I've seen are not aiming to provide the same quality of, of uh, 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 audio that uh, Pono is uh, trying to get, uh, you know, they're trying to go back to the tapes and, and give you like 96k or, or, or more and 192 whatever, it's, it's just uh, insane uh, the uh, quality and, and definition uh, we've seen like a, a service like Tidal and, and these are elite uh, launch uh, and we've seen a, a lot more interest in those kind of companies so I don't know, I don't know if that's just uh, something that it's, you know, in theory, it's something that every single provider can switch on. You know, I'm sure Spotify have uh, WAV files of every single track they've got on Spotify. So in theory, they would just need to flick a switch and have enough server capacity to provide that service to their users should they choose to do that. Uh, but it just feels like, you know, it created a, a bit of momentum around that. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm still not entirely sure that the uh, kind of high quality audio streaming thing is a is a is a goer yeah i think there's been significant press coverage and there's been significant sort of crowd-funded response to the neil young thing but i'm still not you know it's it's if you took neil young out of that would pono ever have sort of gotten as far and so i wonder yeah. if it, it's, it's it's more of a comment on the selling power of Neil Young than uh, <laughs> potentially the the, uh, the the prospect itself, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it'll be interesting to see. But I, I, I still, I mean, I think we've discussed this on a previous show, and I, I sort of say the same thing now as I did then, which is that I, I, I still just sort of think that there's nothing to stop Spotify at some point just re-encoding all of their catalogue to be at crazy high uh quality and offering a sort of spotify premium plus you know yeah. where for 12.99 you get crazy high quality streaming yeah that's the thing like i think every single streaming service receives wav files so i think spotify and deezer and all those guys audio should already have wavs of everything essentially uh 
But it's, those WAVs would only be 44 kilohertz yeah. and whatever it is, 16 So they'd be bit. like on a plain, level playing field, essentially, unless the labels decide to license some of the stuff they re-encoded for Pono uh, to other people. But I, I don't, I've, I've got the feeling that Pono is actually paying for some of that work, so I don't know if they'll be able, they'll be able to or not. So, yeah, it's interesting times, because, like, as you said, we're stuck at the 44.1 CD quality. If mm. people want to go beyond that, it's going to require a lot of investment. And if Pono has made that investment and has got the ownership of the market, then maybe they have something there. Uh, who knows? But, yeah. It'd be interesting to see, certainly. I mean, I think, like all these things, you know, as, as with the niche services from Beatport and so on, it, it needs to be explored. Yeah. I just don't particularly feel at this point that, you know, for all the reasons I said before, really, where, you know, we're still trying to establish that there's a viability for streaming full stop. So to then do niches within that, uh, it feels a bit like it's jumping the gun. But yeah. Who knows? You know, I mean, it, it would sort of be oddly nice to be proven wrong yeah. if suddenly we can turn from a, a, a long standing period where convenience is king to one where actually people strive for quality over, you know, the access issue. Um, that would be great. But and also, uh, like, uh, you know, I guess we, we have also seen that prices of hardware drop significantly. So, like, the, I guess, like, five years ago, a pair of year, but the cost, you know, 10 pounds or 15 or 20 pounds would have sounded absolutely horrendous now you can probably find a relatively decent sounding pair of earbuds for the same price and if it continues to go this way maybe in you know five years we're going to have a pair of earbuds for 20 quid that is actually mm. where you can actually hear the difference between you know uh, an mp3 and, and a WAV file which yep. may not be the case today no well that's it and you know i mean that's the irony isn't it is you know you can stream the highest quality audio but if what you're then playing it through is is not capable of discerning the difference uh then you're equally going to fall short i mean it's something i found quite odd about youtube's music key service yeah uh, because i use google play music um i got that free and you know bundled in and uh so i took a couple of videos offline but then was sat there listening to them on the train and just kind of realized the audio quality is awful because um, I think they're all encoded at 128k, so there really is quite a noticeable difference between <laughs> yeah. that and your audio that you've taken offline yeah. from Google Play Music. You know, if you A B the two, then YouTube just sounds unbelievably bad. And it's sort of things like that where I was sitting there thinking, like, <laughs> I'd be more interested in getting the videos on YouTube up to 320k MP3 than I ever would. Pono. Yeah. Um, you know, so, <laughs> yeah, interesting one. And finally, the most disappointing story of the year. I'm going to go, I mean, at least as far as 2014 is concerned as a whole, with YouTube music. Uh, just purely because we've been talking about it non stop and we were, you know, talking about fights with them. We are interviewed the in independents about it. We went on for the whole year and then it got launched and it was restricted to a very small number of people or people that were already subscribed to Google, Google, uh, 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 pl play music, whatever it's called. Uh, so, so that's the spirit. So I found, Google something. <laughs> so I found myself thoroughly underwhelmed by the whole thing. And I feel like even people that tried it out were like, well, it feels like a separate app. And it's kind of a bit weird of an experience because you have these two different apps that you have to use and, and juggle through. So I don't know. I, I'm kind of like I, I, I wasn't feeling it when it came out, but maybe I'll, feel, I'll, I'll be feeling it next year once they release the proper out of beta application. The the proper what application? The proper uh, out of beta, like sort of like the the proper thing after they've tried it. <laughs> is, is, yeah, well, what am I using? I thought I had the whole thing. I no, I mean like in the like... sense that they're, they're, they're saying that for s people that receive it now, they get, get it free for six months because uh, mm. it's still in testing, I guess, uh, to a certain extent. So uh, I'm just, I, I wonder whether they're going to be able to sort of uh, collate the experience a little bit more and make it a bit more uh, sort of uh, united between the two apps because now it's, it seems very bitty and convoluted. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the integrations between the two are, are absolutely awful. I mean, it, you know, it's things like, I mean, I, I, I like the notion. I mean, Google are, are sort of frustrating on that front because they're very good at being quite geeky about stuff and figuring out what people, you know, what stuff would work. So on a sort of functional level, they can be very good at, at actually supplying, you know, very decent features without bloating it too much and, and all those sorts of things. But on the other hand, they just they, they, within that they can just make such howling errors yeah. around the user experience that you you it, it can be very frustrating. And for me, you know, it's 
you know it's, it's things like if you if you're playing a song you know and it says oh this song's on youtube and you then sort of press the big play button that now shows in the middle of the artwork on the google play music app but then it sort of launches youtube with a lot of spinning wheels and then it finds a video that may not be the official video and then it starts playing it right from the start again rather than where you left off in the clip and it's all very just you know it's a basic data match of like oh you are playing yeah. song x by artist y we will bounce you out to youtube where we've basically just done a search for the same thing i mean this is nothing that you couldn't imagine your average developer putting together in a reasonably small space of time if yeah. we're brutally honest you know this is what tomahawk did years ago or sid lawrence built with the toma.hk you know where it would sit there and you give it a, a, an artist name and a song title and it would find you you know not just soundcloud and spotify but youtube as well i mean it's it's not a million miles from that what I will say is that I, I've, I have warmed slightly to the notion of um, ad-free music videos. I think the problem at the moment is actually a quality one because YouTube is still just festooned with, you know, a lot of very bad quality videos. Interestingly, as a slight aside, I found that a lot of videos from the 90s are encoded at phenomenally poor rates, even on Vivo. Right. So when you dig up, kind of, just just go and look up any old 90s, I don't know, like uh, Alien Ant Farm, Smooth Criminal, go and look that up. The video, you know, the video quality is just dreadful, and it goes across the board. And someone, I, I remember moaning about this, and someone was sort of saying, well, they used to shoot them in local, you know, they weren't shot in 1080 HD, but it's kind of like, well, no, this is not, you know, it looks blocky and... And if I'm watching it on my TV, having seen that there's a broadcast version that I've seen recently that was looked absolutely fine, then clearly it's that's not it. Yeah. But it's those things where, I, yeah, the notion of being able to put on like a stream, you know, make your own MTV and everything, I think is, I mean, it's not a, it's not a thing that you would go running towards them waving yeah. money about for, but it's a good feature if they got it right but it's just the way it's been implemented is is very clunky yeah and it, and so it's a bit of a turn off on that front but it's it's a strange one isn't it you know the i think the thing that google is still fails to ever grasp is that music is is art and culture and it is not a technological thing to just pedal about in the same manner as you know look we do photo filters you know, it's it's deeper than that, and people's connections with it are deeper than that. Yeah. And uh, so you can't just make stuff available and sort of toss it out there and expect people to go running for it. It doesn't work like that. It's a harder <laughs> sell. Um, do, do you have a, a your your own uh, uh, disappointing story of the year? Um, I think that I mean SoundCloud generally just yeah. uh, I'm disappointed by. Um, I I just feel like they've not really you know they, i mean they've long frustrated me and i think you know anyone that knows me knows that i've sort of moaned about them for a while but, but in a, in a, in a, in the sense of really i i felt very strongly that soundcloud could have been an incredible service and just over the years has sort of lost its way um but just everything of late that i see just suggests that there's more sort of floundering on their part and almost now that they're bloated by so much investment you know they're now trying to secure another round of investment which i'm assuming would then allow them to do the deals that they perhaps need to with the majors and things but i just i don't feel like at any point this is a service that everyone's clamoring to get all over now it's lost yeah. that buzz about it and majors might do a deal but that doesn't mean they'll really back it and equally it doesn't mean that users will put up with it yeah I, so I, I, yeah the know. question is like are users standing there with their wallets open just waiting and wishing that they could pay money to soundcloud I'm, I'm not sure no exactly but it's you know between that and the fact that on the flip side all the labels are saying well, we'll just keep cracking down and pulling content you know and, and most of the majors now have a kind of ban on soundcloud ostensibly i mean certainly universal will not allow the use of it full stop um and so within all of that you know it it, it doesn't really shape up that well it just it's just frustrating. You know, I've got nothing against them. Like every time I talk about SoundCloud, I say the same thing, which is that, you know, the people that are still there, certainly, I mean, there's been a few exits of late, but yeah. the people I dealt with have always been really good, really helpful, really savvy. Um, but just that they seem to have lost their way a bit. So at a time when I felt that SoundCloud could have been stridently taking a lead and, and serving yeah. 
more to both the end user and the rights holder, they, to me, seem to have failed across the board. So, you know, Google being a disappointment with things like the YouTube music key is maybe not a surprise because Google don't have a, a, yeah. a good track record on that front. Um, SoundCloud, on the other hand, I think everyone had high hopes for. And, yeah. and so it feels like perhaps that's the reason I'm slightly more disappointed with them than, than maybe the I YouTube mean, I guess story. like the justification I have for what's been happening is, is having been there myself, it all, like when I was faced with that being at a company where we were trying to get the deals done and it was difficult to get them through uh, with majors, it kind of felt like that affected, massively affected the way the product was being shaped as well uh, because we didn't really know where we were gonna go if or if we didn't get the deals done and how that would shape the future of the product as well. And so if they're in that kind of situation where they're not exactly sure how the deal is gonna shape up, I guess that's probably why we haven't seen a great deal of movement on the product from this year. Uh, but that's a, a But it's I mean it's potentially a sort of it's a complete speculation the, on my part, but <laughs> you know, it might be a, just a, the whole thing being a, a, a case study for the future of the perils of, you know, a company with you know a, a business model that required a very long game yeah. that absolutely required the buy-in of the majors and which took a hell of a lot of investment money along the way um you know because now they're invested up to the hilt they've got to please those people by turning this round and making not just a profit but a you know a by a factor of 10 of what's been plowed into them and they've plowed a lot of money in there so, you know, for, for SoundCloud to do that, they then need these people on board. And this is no longer standing there with the majors coming to you saying, we love your service, let's get involved. It's the majors going, you know what, we're not bothered. Yeah, so we, we got, can we pull all other, of it and yeah. make your life really hard. Or you can sign this probably quite aggressive deal that then means that either way, you're probably not going to get the money that you want or need to in order to survive. Yeah. So, I, you know, I do worry that maybe in five years we'll be some, someone, you know, at the at the BIM Institute in Brighton or somewhere will be sat there going, you know, here's your case study of <laughs> what not to do, you know, yeah. um, with SoundCloud as an example. Who knows? Uh, I'll be, you know, I'll be delighted if I'm eating crow 12 months from now. Me too, yes. And, uh, and they're monetized Absolutely. and they're doing well. Um, I think actually if that could be achieved, that would be quite a positive thing for everybody. Oh, yeah. Uh, amazing. Unfortunately, at this point, I'm just a bit skeptical. Yeah. Sorry. And uh, f uh, I think we come to towards the end. Uh, the only uh, last couple of news for uh, this year would be that Audium closed a new one million dollar round. And again, uh, the issue of transparency and trying to figure out the back end and the money and how to get the money is uh, been a running theme of 2014. So great to end the year with uh, another investment in the company. Uh, and you know, we've seen Cobalt do a lot of work in this area, and a lot of people are tr sort of putting their heads together and trying to. Figure figure out how to get people paid and how to really properly account for royalties uh, uh, from all, all these different services. And finally, The Collective has uh, uh, essentially is shuttering its uh, uh, music management uh, division, which was a uh, pretty surprising news for me anyway, because uh, it seemed like at least up until two or three years ago when I, when I was going down there, they, they, they were doing pretty well. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, apparently the Linkin Park pulled out and, and they decided to go self-managed and uh, essentially that spurred the company to focus on its uh, digital uh, multi-channel uh, uh, venture uh, rather than on the management side of things. So uh, very interesting stuff there. And uh, that's all for uh, 2014. Uh, Darren, thanks so much for joining me today and in several other shows this year. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you've been fantastic. And thank you so much. <laughs> it's been my pleasure. I love coming on this show. It's, it's great. I do where, else, where else do you I get? Do. Where else do you get like a, a, a Christmas wintry scenery? Uh, I know, right? I mean, for special effects alone, this is on exactly. some Spielberg, George Lucas <laughs> level of. of <laughs> utter genius yeah. <laughs> I think you know, uh, it feels like the system is a little more stable now so uh, if I don't jinx it I'm going to try and um, get some more animations going on because in the last year I, I kept getting crashes and so I've, I've been pretty s uh, playing it safe with uh, uh, transitions and using videos in between stuff mm. but now I might actually be able to play some video segments and do some bits and bobs in between the show I did love that before we started this you remarked that you've just upgraded everything and that therefore it was there was no way it could crash <laughs> which i just felt was like a red rag well, to a bull well i said <laughs> i said it's law to intervene and prove you wrong <laughs> i but said it hasn't so, so far we, we i mean we haven't the show hasn't ended yet no exactly. we're like 99.9 yeah. percent there. there yeah exactly. so far 
no technical cock up, Sandro. Well done. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good way to end the year, actually. Time. A good way yeah, to end exactly. the year. This, if this is a ferment for 2015, <laughs> then I'm, I'm all for that. We're all good. You not having technology waging a war against you. Exactly, because <laughs> that, that, that was sort of a problem this year. I had to lo sort of load everything up an hour earlier and just start making tests in case everything kind of came to a halt, uh, which it sometimes happened. Uh, in any case, uh, thank you so much for listening to the show this year and feel free to get in touch uh, with any question you might have over the holidays uh, or if you'd like to uh, be part of the show. Obviously, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of... I keep meeting like really great people out there that say that they listen to the show uh, almost every week. So if you are one of those great people out there and you'd like to contribute to the show somehow, uh, please do give me a shout I always, uh, I'm always looking for new guests and uh, uh, thanks so much for listening uh, have a fantastic uh, holiday break and until uh, next time